From the very beginning of my time in this fandom, a Persona 3 remake is something that has always been on people's minds. Since Persona 5 really popped off, people were hoping for a Persona 3 remake in the likeness of Persona 5. When Persona 3 Dancing came out, people were 100% positive that it was just on the horizon. That ended up not being the case. But people still held on to that hope. As for me, I was pretty comfortable with Persona 3 as is. I never really felt as though I needed a remake. I think another part of it was that the fandom really tainted the idea of a remake for me, as I felt as though no one really respected the original vision for the story, or what actually made the game stand out from the rest. It felt like people just wanted to mold it into another Persona 5. Hell, it felt like they just wanted to mold everything into Persona 5 at the time. Before last year, I didn't even think this remake was gonna exist. There was even a point where I found the idea of a remake repulsive. I've never been of the mindset that a remake should fundamentally change a game. It should refine or add on to it. I always point to the Final Fantasy IV remakes as the primary examples of what a remake should be. The PSP version ironed out the bugs and added some quality of life features to the ATB system, like being able to see the spell cast times and being able to pass turns instead of being obligated to perform an action when a character's command menu pops up, and allowing the player to compose a party of any of the past playable characters on the final stretch of the game is just genius. The characters were perfectly implemented back in too. Reserve XP was added to keep your whole roster caught up, and a dungeon for you to update the equipment of your old party members makes everyone viable for the final dungeon. They even made some of the less useful characters better. Edward's Apollo Harp is strong against like half the enemies in the Lunar Depths. The DS remake, while lacking the post-game content and full character roster of the PSP version, adds a new mechanic to add some flavor to the formula. Not some stupid-ass backported mechanic from one of the later games, it was a unique mechanic to itself, at least at the time. So when I caught wind that a Persona 3 remake was in the works, and that it was going to be a faithful one at that, I actually found myself way more receptive to the idea than I thought I would. I guess I never considered a faithful remake to be an option, I just went on the assumption that Atlas would ruin everything because that's the image everyone planted in my head. That and Atlas has a track record for doing that kind of thing apparently. I never played any of these games, so I can't attest to their quality. Nevertheless, here we are right now. Supposedly the goal of this remake was not just to add content, but also to remain as faithful to the original as possible. Let's see how well Persona 3 Reload follows through on that, and also if the new features fit in with it at all. Before I begin, I should make it clear that this video is made with the assumption that you've played Persona 3 Reload, or at least the original games. I won't be doing a breakdown of the story and characters again because I've already done that in my retrospective of the original. If you want something like that, I would recommend watching that video. This video will still contain spoilers, however, as I will be making comparisons to the original PS2 version throughout the entire video. I recommend playing literally any version of this game first before watching this video if you want to avoid having the story spoiled for you. This is your only warning. Something worth addressing here is that in my old video I didn't really bring up too many criticisms I had with the original game, the ones I did express I really didn't dwell on too much. Now granted, the point of that video wasn't really to critique the game, but rather to analyze how the game stood out from the crowd. Not just from the rest of the series, but from most games at the time too. I don't want to give off the impression that I think Persona 3 was a perfect game, however. It might actually be a good thing that I waited until now, because I don't have to worry about repeating myself. Let's start off with the life sim elements. My biggest criticism of the original Persona 3 is the lack of night activities. 
Once you max out your social stats, you've got two night social links. Then after those two night social links, you're basically just sleeping most nights away. Unless you decide to max your persona stats through the roof with the arcade. The only real upside to this is that it allowed you to spread out your Tartarus excursions a lot more. But still, considering how big a part of the game the social sim aspect is, they definitely could have done more with that aspect of it. One of the things I was actually pretty excited about was the expansion of Nightlife. The main cast of Persona 3 are not tied down by parents or guardian figures, so logically they have the most freedom and agency with their time. As such, the player is given time to do whatever they want at night. No need for back massages or your uncle's permission. In the original game, you were limited to just a few select activities at Polonia Mall. Your options have been expanded to Iwatodai Strip Mall as well. In fact, a lot of the restaurants there have specials that can only be bought on certain days of the week. You're also able to work at certain places as a way of earning money without needing to grind battles or chests for it. These are nice additions, but for the most part, the first two months of the game will largely be the same as the original, with you focus on grinding away your social stats. They added a few more stat checks here and there to make them a little more prevalent, and also incentivize the player to explore and discover different places through ranking up their stats. Once Fuka moves into the dorm though, that's when things really start to open up at night. You also gain access to the, the internet. You can buy URLs from the sketchy dark web guy. These can increase your social parameters just like everything else but can also unlock certain item options for purchase, increase your wages for your jobs, and upgrade your sprint to basically turn every battle into an ambush just by charging at the enemies. But the biggest addition by far is doing things with your party members around the dorm. This does sort of raise the question of whether this kind of ruins the more distant nature of the C's members' dynamic with each other. The idea is that their bond is supposed to gradually grow over time organically. They're not super close at first, and Yukari even hates Mitsuru in the early parts of the story. The way they orchestrate these little spend time events is actually pretty consistent with the C's dynamic in my opinion. A vast majority of them are one-on-one -on -one between the protagonist and another character, and none of these activities are really extroverted like anything the Persona 4 cast does. Hey bro, you wanna ride on our scooters and take a bath together? It also kind of fits with the idea of these people all coming from completely different worlds, basically needing to learn to live with each other. Each character will have two different activities you can do with them. I thought this was a pretty neat detail as each member's preferred way to spend time felt in character. Mitsuru is definitely the type of character you'd expect to see having a nice cup of tea and a book to read. Shinjiro, being the iron chef that he is, would totally be either in the kitchen or out growing healthy vegetables. Other matchups may seem a bit odd at first glance, but actually kind of end up playing into some neat development. Not necessarily fleshing them out as characters, but just as normal, believable people occupying this world. Jinpei learns about reaping rewards from hard work through gardening and takes inspiration from the heroic protagonists of his manga. These activities can also grant your party members special traits that are unique to them in battle. Every character has a good personality trait, so it is definitely worth your time to spend time with your comrades. Admittedly, you still do kinda run out of things to do at the end of the game, but it's not nearly as barren as the original. Overall, I'd say the life sim improvements are a net positive, but since we're on the topic of party members, now would be a good time to get into the dungeon crawling and combat overhaul. The dungeon crawling of the original game is often criticized for being plain and repetitive. While that is a valid point, there are certain aspects of Tartarus that define its personality. 
The dungeon layouts themselves were never the real highlight of going to Tartarus. Really, it was just more of a playground to slay monsters and explore how far you could stretch the battle mechanics. The Floor Guardians, now referred to in this remake as Gatekeepers, are the real highlight of Tartarus. The fun part of Persona 3's dungeon crawling for me was getting to reach a more challenging opponent, one strong enough to warrant putting a checkpoint right before them. And as you see that warp menu grow taller and taller, you get this empowering feeling. You're becoming king of the hill. One thing that genuinely impressed me was how much they were able to change while still preserving this feeling. I was worried that they would have turned Tartarus into a 250 floor Persona 5 palace, which sounds like a logistical nightmare to design. Or worse, they would have turned it into something like the Soul Matrix from Soul Hackers 2. That shit is awful. In Reload, they keep the same general idea as the original. Tartarus is largely just a playground for the player to kill monsters and collect treasure. The early floors are pretty simplistic and ease you into the dungeon crawl. As you progress on to further blocks, however, the architecture starts to become more complex. There are even some dynamic elements to the environment which are really satisfying to look at. You also start discovering more of the anomalies you can randomly stumble upon throughout the dungeon. Some of these are familiar, like dark rooms or the presence of more red or gold shadows. Then you have the monad doors. Instead of relegating monad to its own separate block, they are now hallways containing powerful enemies guarding rare treasures. It comes down to the player's discretion to weigh the risk versus reward. Furthermore, the end of each block starting from the third one will have their own monad passage. These are fixed monad areas with a series of strong enemies rivaling that of the gatekeeper shadows. So really, new Tartarus is just giving you more of what I liked about climbing old Tartarus. The floors are admittedly really spacious though, which make it a lot easier to avoid shadows than the original, where the floors were more claustrophobic. The way they handled navigation crutches in this game is… interesting. Kind of a mixed bag. Navigator characters in past games have always had meaningless stats attached to them, but now at least one of them is actually put to good use. Fuka's SP can be used to grant the player certain crutches if you want to expedite the exploration process. This can range from preventing enemies, save for the Reaper, from seeing you to completely skipping this luck-based minigame where you chase a greed shadow. Some of these really confuse me because they basically make it so that you don't even have to engage with the mechanics and gimmicks that Tartarus throws at you. It also costs SP for her to fully scan enemies and also cannot be done until after the first turn cycle. This is a nice median between the trial and error of Persona 4 and 5 that I'm not really a fan of, and Persona 3 where the scan was called at the beginning of the turn and would go through after the enemy got their move. This brings us to the other changes to the battle system, where things are going to be a little more contentious. I'm gonna assume everyone here is already familiar with how the one more system in Persona works, Striking weaknesses knocks down the enemy, knocking down the enemies grants more turns, knocking down all enemies leaves an opening for an all-out attack, the works. I'm more interested in inspecting the new features tacked onto it. Persona 5 introduced Baton Pass, allowing the characters to pass their extra turn along to another character to keep the flow of the battle going. This is mostly helpful for when you're facing a mixed group of enemies with different weaknesses, instead of needing to waste that one more and wait for the next character's turn. You can strike one enemy's weakness, then pass to another character to immediately strike the next enemy's weakness, which isn't covered by the initial character. This feature has been implemented in Reload, now dubbed as Shifting. It's not as flashy as watching the characters pass the baton to each other, but it's more befitting of the group's dynamic. They're a bit more formal as a team, so seeing them be able to communicate to each other for a follow-up attack with just a look feels pretty smooth and satisfying. There aren't as many perks to passing along turns in this game as Persona 5 Royal. There are passive skills that can boost damage or recover a tiny bit of SP when being shifted to, but the damage doesn't ramp up like it would in Royal. 
This is a neat addition to have in battles, as it helps keep the momentum going, and can actually help with more efficient SP consumption, instead of just having the protagonist or some other character carry and sweep the whole battle on the first turn, at the cost of a bunch of SP. You can split the work without needing to waste turns. Is what I would say if I wasn't playing with the party tactics. We'll put a pin in that for now though. Something I loved about the Persona 3 cast as party members was the variety and utility of each character. It's probably the best in the series in my opinion. I've always gone at length about it in the original game, but how well does it carry over to this remake? Well, aside from general skill setups, Reload's way of emphasizing each character's unique playstyle is through the use of theurgy and personality traits. About two months into the game, you're introduced to this new tool at your disposal. Every character has a meter that fills up over time. When it's full, the character will be able to perform a theurgy. Most of these are basically just super attacks that ignore resistances, but can still strike weaknesses if applicable. The meter will fill up no matter what, but each character has a different way of filling it up faster. This is where the game starts to sort of tailor each character into their own playstyle. For example, Yukari's fills up from healing, and Mitsuru's fills up when inflicting ailments on enemies. The protagonist's theurgy attacks are his fusion spells. Instead of needing the personas in your active stock or needing to craft them with gems, you just need the right personas registered to your compendium. Your fusion spells will work off the stats and passive skills you have on your currently equipped persona. Some of these fusion spells are kind of absurd, even as early as Jack Bros. Almighty attack that can down enemies, dear Allah. Fuka's theurgy can also be pretty unfair if you get the charge and concentrate effect. But wait, that's not all. Remember those personality traits I mentioned earlier during those night activities? This is where they come into play. Not only does the game push the player into the right direction on how to use each character with their theurgy meter conditions, but they also reward it with each character's personality trait. Each trait has two stages. Each one is acquired through spending time with a party member three times on one of their two dorm activities. Doing it with both their dorm activities will enhance that trait. These are the bread and butter of the characters in this game, and it's up to you, the player, to figure out which characters synergize the best to form the best party comp for you. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Unfortunately, these Thurgy attacks are really, really spammable. You don't really need them for most normal encounters, so you're probably just gonna end up saving them for boss battles, and then just end them in the first turn. If I could make one change, I'd make it so that when a character's theurgy meter is fully charged, they have to use it or it'll go to waste and their meter will empty afterwards. I'm not opposed to the idea altogether, they add personality to the characters, I just think they stack things a little too much in the player's favor. While we're on the topic of things unique to characters, let's talk about the weapon types. Yeah, you heard me right. You know what that means. Weapon types are purely specified for their own character. None of the fun weapon versatility with the pros and cons of choosing one weapon over the other. In fact, to this day, Persona 3 and Persona 3 Fess on the PS2 are still the only Persona games where the protagonist is able to wield multiple weapon types. I think there's a discussion to be had about how much this actually impacts the gameplay experience. In the original game, the different weapon types gave the player different ways to approach enemies. You could use a bow to ambush them from a safe distance in exchange for power, or you could use a more powerful weapon that has a slower recovery after you swing it. In Reload, you literally just sprint into enemies and always get the advantage now. The protagonist is supposed to be the character the player relates to the most, and a big part of that is because of how versatile he is. The people you choose for him to hang out with, the personas you can have him take on, and even a seemingly small detail like his preferred weapon. It also astounds me how hard they went on animating each weapon attack for the protagonist as well. Every different set of animations exudes a different personality and fighting style. With the one-handed sword, he has a more typical protagonist victory pose. With the bow, he has a more elegant stance. With the spear, 
he looks off to the side like that fight was nothing. With the hammer, he does a hair flip. This shit goes hard, bro. A lot of the fans nowadays seem to want the protagonist to be more of a predefined character, so I guess this game fits in more with that desire? Regardless, I still found the equipment system in this game to provide a pretty good amount of variety, in battle at least. You still have weapons that change your basic attack attribute, though now there's usually going to be more of a trade-off between attack power or having your attack property changed. However, in Reload, you can get these types of weapons pretty early compared to Fess or Portable, where there were only a select few to choose from. This may not sound like a huge deal, but being able to change your attack property can be great for going into areas with lots of enemies weak to said element. It can be a nice SP saving measure. It can also save your ass from enemies that repel or drain physical attacks while enraging your party, forcing them to attack with their weapons. You're not going to have Akihiko rocking ice gloves or Ken using a wind spear, but you still have some neat options. The weapon fusion system in general has been tweaked quite a bit as well. As a matter of fact, it's not just weapons anymore, it's all kinds of equipment. On the wider side of equipment things, the effects of weapons and armor aren't random anymore. But again, they provide enough variety for it to be interesting. Generic weapons and armor can be bought at the police station. But that's boring and not worth your money at all. Literally get your equipment from anywhere but the police station. You'll pretty regularly be able to gather materials from monad doors and passages to craft a few neat pieces of gear from the antique shop, which is what you'll be using instead of fusing your personas into them like before. For equipment, that makes sense, but come on, the idea of fusing your inner demon or god into a weapon sounds way more metal. You can get pretty good equipment just from collecting treasure and gathering materials at Tartarus. Some of the more advanced equipment might require heart items from your personas, but overall, equipment choices felt pretty meaningful outside of just numbers. You could get away with stuff that can null a certain status ailment or evade or reduce damage from an element. This can be good for enemies that spam said element, or maybe even to reduce the incoming damage of an element one of your party members is weak to. I found most accessories aside from the really early lower tier ones to be pretty useful as well. One of my favorite parts playing Persona 3 was the party specking, and I must say Reload was able to hold up that part pretty damn well. You know, I used to kinda think I was the only one who grew to like the AI based party members from the original game over time. It's a system that becomes very satisfying to use once you've mastered it. Over time though, I've noticed gradually more and more people giving it another shot and warming up to it more. And here we are today, there are people just casually playing the game with the party tactics even when they don't have to. So needless to say, I'm sure there were at least a good chunk of people looking forward to some kind of refinement or modernization of the old P3 battle system. In some ways, Reload kind of succeeds in this, but not in the way it ought to. This game was undoubtedly designed with direct control in mind, and all the characters will default to direct control when they first join your party. The AI options are still there though. Don't get me wrong, the AI in this game is leagues above Persona 4. In fact, I found it pretty sufficient for 99% of the game. But sufficient and efficient aren't the same thing. In theory, the AI of Reload is more flexible in the sense that they can read situations better when set to act freely. This means party members can cast buffs or debuffs while they're set to act freely on any free turns they have to waste. They can even use half HP revival items from your inventory. It's not bad, but it could definitely be a lot better. Something that was really neat about the party members in the original game is that they were able to fully take advantage of the battle mechanics, and had a wider array of tactics you could give them, allowing you to better manipulate the AI to follow along with your strategy. The amount of options the player is given is not only enough for the player to get by, 
but enough to fully take advantage of the different strategies and mechanics at your disposal. You could go on an all-out assault, you could play it safe and stunlock enemies, you could specifically seek out to attack fallen enemies to capitalize on skills like Cruel Attack or Vile Assault. The AI in the PS2 version could do whatever it should be able to do. The Reload AI can't even do everything it should be able to do in Reload. Your party members will not guard on their own unless they are literally not able to do anything else to the enemy. As stated earlier, you can shift into party members, but they'll never shift themselves. Buffs and debuffs are also relegated to an off-turn thing rather than an actual priority, even when set to heal and support. That's better than not using them at all, but still, a downgrade from the original game. Party members don't also seem to be aware of what fills their 3G gauges faster. Sure, it'll fill up no matter what, but the key word here is efficiency. The AI is smart enough to use their 3G attacks though. Hell, they even know which one is better to use depending on the situation. For example, Mitsuru will use her Almighty Theurgy if the enemy isn't debilitated yet, and if it is, she'll opt for her Ice one. If you have Ice Boost alongside Varna Bracers equipped on her, this can actually net more damage. Now, I'm aware that there's a mod that addresses pretty much all these criticisms, but still, Given how much effort was already put into preserving the feel of the original and the sort of hindsight appreciation for the original system in recent years, it shouldn't have been hard to foresee people coming into this remake expecting a revitalized version of that experience. You can't even see the whole turn cycle outside of who's next, so it's abundantly obvious that they kinda just wanted to brush this old idea to the side instead of actually trying to improve it. They really only would have needed to iron out a few kinks. They basically gave up after their first try, and given the type of hostility people can give you for even trying to do something different these days, I almost kinda sympathize. But that's enough of what I want, no one gives a shit about that. Let's talk about the more general balancing of the game. Well, I can only speak as someone who played the game on Merciless mode. Even though I played with the party tactics, my circle of friends also played Merciless with direct commands, and we all generally agree on this point. The game can actually be kinda challenging at some points if you're going in completely blind. Pretty much all of my friends and I only had seconds on the clock left when we beat the full Moon Priestess. Once you get to around the halfway point though, is where the balancing starts to lean more into the player's favor. Theurgy attacks are just too powerful, as I said earlier, but by far the thing that breaks this game in half the most is probably how absurdly powerful you can make physical skills. In the original, magic was generally better because of boost and amp passives that physical skills didn't have, but physical skills still had their potential to be better if you took advantage of resting your main character, putting him in great condition. In Reload, you have boost and amp passives for slash, strike, pierce, crit rates, and that's on top of apt pupil. Start the battle off with a persona with auto Tarukaja and auto rebellion, switch to your pure physical attacking persona, then just watch everyone get vaporized. Oh, and once you get Scarlet Havoc, the game is just face roll. There are enemies out there that resist physical that might occasionally screw you over, but fizz build is still pretty absurd. Thankfully, most of the Full Moon Shadows are better than their original fights. One change in particular that I like is how the Fortune Boss's roulette will affect both sides with whatever it lands on. The wheel doesn't discriminate. You don't even get to choose when it stops. Hanged Man is also kind of a jerk with how it increases its actions per turn. Overall, despite their efforts, the game after all the Full Moon Shadows are defeated just becomes pretty trivial. Although, I will say that the final boss being able to use attacks of the previous full moon bosses was a nice touch, and even though my main character was level 99, I did have a couple close calls. Still one on my first attempt though, as sloppy as it was. Just watch out for status ailments and you're good. You should be able to buy an accessory that nulls all ailments, and one with insta-heal for Yukari who can follow up with Amrita shower to heal off the rest, and you should be squared away. But believe it or not, there are a large number of people out there who probably won't care about anything I just said. 
there's a sizable audience that only cares about the story. So, let's jump right into it. Okay, Atlas has a bit of a track record of adding new story content to their enhanced re-releases, usually in the form of brand new content that adds onto the story but somehow is only tangentially related. Stuff like Marie from Persona 4 Golden and Maruki from Persona 5 Royal are very much their own things that are integrated into the story rather than an expansion of the characters and world that already exist. I guess that's where a lot of re-releases like Golden and Royal fall short. This isn't always the case, however. Stuff like Persona 1 and 2 PSP remakes leave the story intact, and the extra story content is simply supplemental. The same can be said of the 3DS remakes of Soul Hackers and Devil Survivor. Well, I'm happy to say that Persona 3 Reload takes the latter approach. Nothing about the narrative or how events play out has changed. That's not to say there aren't any new bits of story-related content. For now though, I want to address something about the way they portray said events of the original story. Mainly the direction of the cutscenes. So let me make something clear here, the cutscenes definitely have way more production value than the originals, characters are more on model and just the animation quality in general is much better. My issue is largely with the direction of integral scenes. Sure, the overall idea of every scene is still there, but it doesn't come off as powerful to me personally. This is riddled throughout the whole ass game, from as early as... Yeah, the first cutscene. Alright, so picture this. Let's say you hand Persona 3 off to a friend who has never played it before, with no prior context, not even showing them the opening cinematic. Then, one of the first things they see is a girl pointing a gun to her head, all while flashing back and forth between the rustle and bustle of the city, the music blaring from the protagonist's headphones, and the sound of running water in her room. Then she drops the gun and breaks down in tears, unable to get herself to do it. Now let's take a look at Reload. As soon as this girl is on screen, she says, Just put it to my head. And then pull the trigger. Come on. Oh, so that's not a real gun, got it. It just takes you out of the scene completely. Part of what made the intro so good in the original was the complete lack of dialogue aside from the train announcer, but that guy might as well just be background noise. This is the general gist of what I don't like about the scene direction in Reload. It's not until you play Reload that you realize that a lot of the scenes from the original do a good job speaking for themselves, and it's not as overt or exposition-heavy as people say it is. In the original, Strega hands the suppressants to Shinjiro without a word. This is long before they actually explain what they are, but once they do get to the scene where they give a clearer picture, that small detail makes a whole lot of sense. Now let's look at Reload. <sighs> you seem to be in great pain. Then tell us. I'm sure you'd agree these pills are more important than a group you have nothing to do with. I won't use my power again. Not after last time. Uh... What? The original did such a better job at more subtly hinting at his deal, too. Is this a translation thing, or did they actually just look at the Persona fanbase, saw how fucking dense they are, and then they decided, maybe we should dumb down these scenes for people so they can actually keep up. Oh yeah, they also do that thing in the ending where they verbally announce that Tartarus is disappearing for good now. It's finally happening. 
everything's going back to normal. Uh, okay, this isn't the Our blindfolded is challenge. I can see Tartar is disappearing. And then they all have to express how happy they are to see the protagonist make it back alive. This was a one minute cutscene in the original. They didn't need any words. The reactions on their faces already said everything. And is it just me, or did they make some of these scenes just softer? There's the opening cutscene I mentioned earlier, but the prime example of this is the protagonist awakening to his persona. Any and all intensity from that scene is lost. In the original, Yukari tries to pull the trigger, but is too hesitant and gets clapped. The protagonist stares at the gun, then remembers that very brief moment when she pointed it to her head, and then starts to piece it all together. And then BAM! And then this ferocious beast bursts out of your persona, mauls the shadow, then lets out a ghastly roar. Compare that to Reload. Thanatos is not nearly as intimidating. This is like Freddy Fazbear versus Funtime Freddy. A friend of mine told me a story of showing the original awakening scene to his mom, and she said something among the lines of, Why is he pointing that gun to his head? I don't like that. I know this is just one anecdote, but I can't shake this feeling that they wanted to tone down these scenes so as to not make the player too off-put or uncomfortable so early in the game. I said in my video of the original that I think people play up Persona 3's edginess too much. I still stand by that sentiment, and I feel like there wasn't really any need to tone anything down. There is one particular scene that's the exception, but we'll get to that a little later. One of the nice things they added was the new linked episodes for the male party members. These are actually a little different in nature compared to the simple party member social links. These are split up into 5 segments instead of 10 ranks, and are kind of directly tied to the point of the story you're in, as you can only get installments at specific points in the game. You can unlock certain Persona fusions through completing linked episodes as well. They'll often address the events of the story a lot more directly in these. Linked episodes mostly serve to further humanize the male characters and give you more bits and pieces of their background. This is the only way to hear about Akihiko's foster parents, or how exactly Junpei was into baseball and why he stopped playing, or Ken... existing for more than just a short portion of the game. If you like Ryoji, then you'll really like November because Ryoji gets his own linked episode. Then you've got... him. The man that I just had to dedicate a whole segment of the video to.
If there is anything Persona 3 Reload. did right, it was Shinjiro Aragaki. It's so wild to me how much good these remakes would do for this character. So in the original, Shinji was a pure physical attacker, in a magic-dominated game. At least, at the point of the game he's with you. This is pre-Vorpal Blade territory. Theoretically, he can learn some of the best physical skills in the game, but you're realistically not going to see most of them for the time he's with you, unless you overlevel. That, plus a lack of weakness, makes him potential to be the best party member. This wasn't the case, though. In Reload, however, he is the best party member, hands down. He is the party member who's too good to be permanent, a trope in RPGs that I gladly welcome. You get much better skills earlier on in his lifespan, rocking both Heat Wave and Deathbound, alongside his HP consuming damage boosting skill, bro, literally a Dark Knight from Final Fantasy, all tied up in a nice little bow with his personality trait, Auto Heat Riser. If this character were permanent, I'd keep him in my party for the rest of the game. And his theurgy goes so hard, they took all the edge from the earlier scenes and funneled it into this guy. Dude, his death scene- SHUT THE FUCK UP! While I do like the cinematography of the original scene, where it showed his point of view as he stumbles his last few steps before dying, I personally prefer Ken soaking in Shinjiro's blood like in the movie. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Koromaru in this scene. My heart can't take it. Shinji easily has the best linked episode too. It fleshes out a part of his character I didn't know I needed to know more about until I experienced it. His history with Akihiko and Mitsuru. Now, we already know about him and Akihiko, but they give Mitsuru a lot more involvement here. We just sort of knew that they were friends before, but never actually saw her interact with Shinjiro that much. Mitsuru's really trying to get Shinjiro to come back to school so they could keep the promise that they made that all three of them would graduate together. It meant a lot more than just him being there, it was proof that he still cherished the time they spent together when the team consisted of just those three. You get the impression that these three really have been at it longer than you have, and that these three were a team. Shinjiro ultimately stands his ground and doesn't hand in his paperwork to return to school. But after his death, you can find an incomplete form to return from absence with his signature on it. He remembered his promise, and it was ultimately because you, the player, were able to get him to open up. Shinjiro has easily become my favorite Seas member, aside from Mitsuru because she's best girl. We even get these sweet flashbacks of the original trio. Yo, fuck the answer, where's my DLC for this scenario? He's that guy in high school. We all know who he is. Riku is a sexy guy. He's just a sexy guy. That mysterious guy. Nobody knows anything about him. He's sort of quiet. He's got a he's got a deep, dark kind of sensibility. All the girls like him. And uh, you know, the gamer girls are really gonna like it. And the guys are like, who's this dude? How can I be like him? Every girl goes through a bad boy phase. Come on. You know you like it. Strega also got some much needed attention. Mostly just to Kaya, but still. Despite only getting a few more scenes with him, we get a chance much earlier to really get a feel for his perspective on the Dark Hour and his cursed existence in general. Then you got their boss fights. Kind of a mixed bag for me personally. The first fight with Takaya and Jin was definitely an improvement. My jaw dropped when I saw them baton passing to each other. And then I died. Unfortunately, this is the only victory Strega had over me. Chidori is now just a scripted fight, but she does lay on some huge damage before then, so you gotta at least stay alive. Then, by the end of the game, I was so powerful that not even the new surprises they had for their rematches were all that impressive. Although Takaya having that fucking Stone Age evoker for his thurgy was pretty pog, not gonna lie. Social links, from a scenario standpoint, are mostly the same as the original. A change that caught me off guard though was not being able to choose your clubs. The social link characters are the same no matter what clubs you chose in the original, but that personal touch that's sort of expected when it comes to a life sim is sort of diminished now. 
It's kind of a similar thing to what I said earlier about letting the player change weapons. Some social links were given a line or two of extra context, like the reason for Chihiro's fear of men being because of her father's anger issues. Alternate platonic endings for the girls were also added. Except Mitsuru. Platonic Mitsuru doesn't exist. She can't hurt me. How could you turn this girl down, really? She literally confesses her love to you in public and causes a scene over it. And then you get this cute, tender moment right after, and I just, I, I just- I can't! I can't! I can't do it! I just- I can't do it! The biggest change to the social links wasn't what they did to them, though, but with the addition of fully voice-acted ranks. You know, I made a joke a while back about how people would like the social links better because they no longer had to read them, thanks to the voice acting. Now that I've actually heard all the characters voiced, it really does go a long way to make you appreciate them a lot more. Simply reading dialogue is not quite the same as actually listening to a person speak. Sometimes the delivery of the lines in the voice acting and the inflection you read the dialogue with come off completely differently. This can recontextualize how you originally perceived a certain exchange. The way a character is voiced can really make or break or even shift your opinion of a character a lot. I experienced this firsthand. Yuka was a character I already liked, but her voice actress made me love her. I've seen plenty of people online also share this attitude. Other characters like Tanaka, I actually ended up liking less. It's not because the voice was bad, but rather it portrayed Tanaka as a sleazy con artist a little too well to the point where the character kinda started to piss me off. Then you got Kenji. It's honestly impressive how much his voice acting made him so much more… endearing. Another angle to look at this is that being able to hear the characters speak can allow the players to actually listen to them and really get to understand them more. The voice acting for the main cast was also pretty good in my opinion. I was never really against the change in voice cast at all since the beginning. I'm not a huge voice acting nut, so I don't really know any of these people's other work, but I will say, from the moment I saw them at that voice actor panel, I knew they'd do good. Just hearing Zeno Robinson talk about Jinpei, you could definitely tell he knows this character, and he knows the game. The writing of the story is so good, it relates to what people are actually going through, it related to what I was actually going through, and I remember it was very cathartic to be able to like express this moment that I was having in my own life in a way that I was grieving and going through it along with Junpei. So another one of the biggest appeals to Persona 3 Reload is the modernized visuals. With the power of Unreal Engine, the game surely wouldn't disappoint. It's not like this game's being limited by the Switch like a certain other game. The original Persona 3 had a very minimalist UI aesthetic, but was still pretty pleasing to look at. Sure, you can tell it takes after Persona 5 a bit, but it incorporates enough original elements for it to stand on its own. One of the first things you'll definitely notice just by looking at the game is the prevalence of water. In a lot of ways, this is very appropriate. An interview on the UI development states that they actually contacted the original staff on how the blues and movement of the original game's menus felt reminiscent of water. They actually confirmed that this is what they had in mind. So this wasn't just some arbitrary design choice, but an actual evolution of what the original staff intended. It's also appropriate given the setting of the game being Tatsumi Port Island, being by the ocean. The original Persona 3 also came out in the 2000s, better known as the era of games with too much water. I'm not gonna get into the rationale behind that era of games, so I'm just gonna link a video for you to watch if you want to hear more on that. The menus are also a lot less flashy than Persona 5's, none of the gun pointing and rebellious looks on the protagonist's face. I'm a fan of how all the characters in the status menu are in their own color. Another interesting detail I noticed is how when hovering over Personas in your Persona stock, some proverbial text appears over them. The text is dependent on the arcana of the Persona. I know it's just flavor text, but I'm actually quite a fan of it. 
Speaking of flavor text, every character has their own at the end of their all-out attack animations. I'm actually glad that despite the huge overhaul to the graphics, it still has that minimalist charm compared to Persona 5's more stylistic flair. They even kept the little distortion filter from the original that I like. You know, the one that only happens during the dark hour? You can kind of see it in the corner of the screens and such. There are a few things about the aesthetic that I gotta dock points for though. The thing I'm most disappointed by is the dark hour set pieces. I noticed that they made everything significantly greener. Stuff like the part where you're running along the monorail witnessing Tartarus in the distance is pretty inoffensive. Then you get to the border floors in Tartarus. It looks like a roadblock alright, but the original had these really cool backdrops unique to the theme of that block, sometimes even allowing you to see outside the tower in the distance. One specific example that I was really disappointed they got rid of was the one where you reach the end of block 4, where the game makes it seem as though you've reached the top before it's revealed that there's still way more game left to be played, and then the stairs reappear again. It's completely absent in Reload. Speaking of backdrops, the biggest grievance I have with this is the full moon battle backdrops. The ones for normal encounters look perfectly fine, in fact, some of them I'd say even look better than the original. But the full moon boss backgrounds don't have nearly as much detail as the PS2 versions of the game. So I want you to imagine this. You walk up to the big boss monster, the battle begins, and the first thing to hit your senses is this. The most outstanding examples I can think of are the Hermit boss, where the field is completely covered in the shadow's wires overtaking it, compared to the empty room of Reload. That's green now, by the way. As well as the Hanged Man boss. In Reload, it's just the bridge, but in the original, the bridge is all warped and misshapen. In fact, the trippy backgrounds are kind of a classic Megaton staple, you don't really see any more of these after the original Persona 3. The arena in the final boss against Nick's avatar is also a downgrade. The original had this incredible skybox with the clouds shrouding everything except where the moon shines down on the arena. And also, Reload made it greener. One detail I will say I like though, is the feather particle effects throughout the tower, all leading up to the peak of Tartarus where they converge. Neat. I could go on all day about this game, but this video is already turning out to be way longer than I expected it to be. In fact, it has been for the past five pages now. So let's wrap things up by answering one final question. I never came into Persona 3 Reload with the expectation for it to replace the original. Reload does a lot of good as a game, and has a pretty generally good understanding of the original game. Clearly a lot of love and passion went into this project. However, I'd say Reload only gets a minimum passing grade on its comprehension of what truly made the things they were trying to recreate good. The devil is in the details, which Reload tends to miss out on a lot of. For people who haven't played the original in a long time, or like, at all, the things I mentioned might not bother you at all. But as someone who has revisited Persona 3 many times in the six years I've spent on this franchise, I can't really turn a blind eye to it. When it comes to the cutscene direction, it's pretty hit or miss whether they fully capture what the original scenes try to get across. When it comes to gameplay, a lot of the ideas sound like the logical evolution of the original game experience, but some of them end up kind of being self-defeating. I haven't even gotten into the more minute gripes I have, like Shuffle Time basically having no penalties now, or the weird solution to catching up underleveled party members with the Great Clocks, instead of just having passive XP for reserve party members. Hell, I would have been fine with just 50% passive XP. There's still a lot of things about Reload that I like, and would even say are done better than in the original. But there's also a lot of what made Persona 3 good, either simplified or just completely discarded. 
Persona 3 Reload was a huge opportunity to refine and double down on what made the original so good, and in some areas it succeeds. In the areas where I felt it was most crucial though, it falls short. Between Persona 3 Fess and Persona 3 Reload, I'd say I still like Fess more. Reload certainly had the potential to become my favorite version of Persona 3, but it just barely misses the mark. As for Portable, I don't really think it'd be fair to compare a version that was very obviously compromised to a brand new game built in Unreal Engine. The goal of Reload was to recreate the original experience, so that's how I decided to evaluate it. For a lot of people, Reload will be people's first time playing Persona 3. For others, Reload might be the best version of Persona 3 to them. And I can't entirely blame them for that. Personally, I enjoyed my time with Persona 3 Reload, and I want to replay it at some point. But in my eyes, it just falls short in too many areas from being that near-perfect version of Persona 3. 